Hi everyone, this is Chris Grosso with the Indie Spiritual Podcast on the Be Here Now Network. And my guest today is Pilar Jennings, PhD. Hello, Pilar. How are you? Hi, Chris. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, So I'm going to read your bio, and then I also want to read a short description of the book we're going to be discussing today that you wrote, which uh, is exceptionally fascinating, as I mentioned to you before we started this conversation. But uh, let me let me get that out of the way, and then we'll jump right into things. Sure. Uh, Pilar Jennings, PhD, is a psychoanalyst in private practice with a focus on the clinical applications of Buddhist meditation. She has been working with patients and their families through the Harlem Family Institute since 2004. A visiting lecturer at Union Theological Seminary and a guest lecturer at Columbia University, she is also the author of Mixing Minds, The Power of Relationships in Psychoanalysts and Buddhism. And then a little bit more about you and the book. Um, Early on in her clinical practice, psychoanalyst Pilar Jennings was presented with a particularly difficult case. A six-year-old girl who, traumatized by loss, had stopped speaking. Challenged by the limitations of her training to respond effectively to isolating to the isolating effect of childhood trauma, Jennings takes an takes the unconventional path of inviting her friend Lama Pema, a kindly Tibetan Buddhist monk who experienced his own life shaping trauma at a very young age, into their sessions. So about the book, into the book is called to a to heal a wounded heart. The Transformative Power of Buddhism and Psychotherapy in Action, which was published by Shambhala, whom I absolutely love. Um, Pilar Jennings describes how, in the warm therapeutic space they create, the young girl slowly begins to heal. The result is a fascinating case study of the intersection of Western psychology and Buddhist teachings. Pilar's story is for therapists, parents, Buddhists, or any of us who hold out the hope that even the deepest childhood wounds could be the portal to our capacity to love and be loved. And like I said, um, an exceptionally fascinating book, Pilar. So let's, let's jump right into that. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, you, you have this case with a six year old girl, you know, she's your patient. She stops talking. So I figure if, if, you could, you know, maybe you could start with giving us a brief overview of the situation and the kind of therapy that you'd used. Mm -hmm, Sure. So uh, this was early on in my training and like all all, uh, prospective clinicians who are training to be psychoanalysts, Mm -hmm. the primary tool is, is one of listening. Right. And so what's emphasized in our training is, is how to, to listen for nuance, how to listen for what's harder for the patient or the client to access, what might be hidden in the unconscious. Right. And so the expectation is that we're, we're going to be hearing a lot from the patient. And what I found, and, and I think many, many therapists have this experience, is that this particular patient um, was not able to talk freely or at all yeah. most of the time. She was a, my only patient who didn't talk much, uh, but I, I felt that I was really learning about how to enter into the treatment that the patient needs with her. Mm. Very fascinating. Actually, that's interesting here because I'm, I'm very transparent in the show and I'm in therapy myself. So mm-hmm. I appreciate what you just said. Now I'm going to keep my eye on my therapist while I'm speaking to see how, you know, he's relating to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's fascinating. <Right. laughs> um, so, you know, so you're, you're having this struggle with her talking. And um, you know, I guess before we go a little bit deeper into that, um, I want to talk about trauma, you know, mm-hmm. because that's a very, very big topic. Um, and there are all different kinds of trauma. Um it was actually brought to my attention years ago. I had interviewed Gabor Mate, who's a, a very renowned um, addiction expert. And he was telling me about what he calls little T traumas, which are, you know, the small things like possibly your parent, you know, spanking you or yelling at you or being bullied at school. And then the big T traumas, which are, you know, like natural disasters or terrorist attacks, um, you know, things of that nature. So obviously there's all different kinds of traumas. So I was wondering if you could give us in your perspective an overview or like a general definition. So 
you know, we're all kind of on the same page. Sure, sure. Well, I, I think trauma can be understood as any experience that overwhelms our, our capacity to cope. Mm. And that's, that's a simple, pithy uh, understanding of trauma, but I think it gets at, at the fundamental experience of something happening to us that we don't have consolidated defenses uh, to respond with. Right. And instead, often there's the sense of being undone by it or done in by it. And as you say, Chris, you know, this can be something major like uh, a car accident right. or a natural disaster, but it could also be those, those mini experiences with the caretaker who is repetitively not on the same page with us. Right. So that's, that's subtle, right? So also, also traumatizing, right? And so, because a lot of people, and myself very much included, um, I'm I'm in uh, recovery from drugs and alcohol myself, and part of what was confusing to me because I also went to school for addiction counseling, and um, you know I'm I'm doing I did two internships, and one of the repetitive stories that. Um, seemed almost in every case that came through my way was some sort of childhood trauma. Um, you know, whether it was molestation, rape, you know, things of that nature. And in, for all intents and purposes, I had a relatively normal childhood. Um, you know, I mean, my parents had their arguments, but I was never molested or beaten or anything like that. Um, you know, so I always found it interesting that I st- I didn't have what you know most of these other people had, so that's when the the little t traumas started to make a little more sense. Because sure, you know, I I got in trouble and I was always the black sheep of the family. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, and then another interesting thing actually that someone brought to my attention, and maybe you could speak a little to this, and then we'll get back to the book. But sure. you know, trauma I think is such an important topic. Um, after that interview I had mentioned with Gabor. Um, I posted it on YouTube because I'd done a video version of it and somebody commented asking me about my birth and if there was any birth trauma and I had never thought about that but it hit me like a ton of bricks after they commented because I was born in 1978 in a small hospital up in Maine and my mom was actually told a few months into the pregnancy that I was not going to be born um, Mm -hmm. the way I was developing And so she carried that stress and that, um, you know, sadness and pain and and whatever other emotions came along with it. And um, even right up to the birth, um, they didn't think I was going to make it. I ended up being a C-section, but I lived. And here I am now, 39 years old, healthy human being. Um, But I also, you know, after that, um, in therapy, I've talked about the trauma that even though I was still in her womb, you know, how that could have affected me. Um, Do you have any thoughts on that for anyone, you know, that might be in a similar situation to me who struggles maybe not with drugs or alcohol, but any kind of depression, anxiety, and can't quite place their finger on it? Yeah. Thanks, Chris. And this is such a, such a critically important issue because, there's, there's so much shame, as you know, around our, our personal difficulties and problems and addictions yeah. and all the stuff that we get stuck in. Right. Uh, there's usually a lot of shame about it, oh, especially yeah. if we cannot easily identify a cause. Mm. Right. So if nobody locked us in the closet or deprived us in some horrific way, or if, if our parents have obviously suffered more than we have... Right. And yet we seem to have more problems than they do. There's often a, a great deal of, of self-criticism, self-attack, and shame. But what you're pointing to is that um, the, the imprinting that happens before we're born is actually quite profound. Mm. And so there's, there's certainly the in utero experience, there's the birth experience, but there's also an intergenerational component to trauma. Mm. So if our parents were traumatized in a way that hasn't quite gotten worked out, 
it's very likely to, to impact us and end up in our own psyche in a way that's, that's mysterious. Yes, quite so. <laughs> right? And, and you hear this in more, more stark examples from children of Holocaust survivors, children of, of uh, parents who survived war, that the parents were not abusive, they took good care of the children, and yet right. the, the adult children are really struggling with something that they can't, they can't easily identify. Right. And maybe trying to manage the pain through addiction or some, some form of self-soothing. Right. And so for those that are struggling with that, mm -hmm. what do you recommend? You know, therapy or meditation or because I mean, we're going to get back to with this crossover between, you know, Buddhism and psychoanalysts. Uh, but um, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I feel very curious to, to many forms of healing. Mm -hmm. And when I'm working with patients, I encourage them to explore because I know that they're going to need support beyond our time together and, and outside of our work. Sure. I'm, I'm not shy about letting, letting my patients know that meditation has been helpful for me. Right. And having spiritual community, having places where I feel warmly received has been psychologically helpful for me. Yeah. Um, so I definitely encourage people to find support and help. And psychotherapy or psychoanalysis is often a, a very effective form of support. Yeah. where there's, there's an opportunity for people to really get to know themselves very specifically. Right. To take, take their experience out of the general yeah. and really feel into to what they're, they're going through and what they've already lived through. Yeah. Well, I couldn't agree more. I, um, I'm often asked myself, you know, because I have uh, several books out now and uh, a yeah. lot of them touch on not just recovery from drugs and alcohol but general healing but a question i'm often asked is you know what form of recovery do you recommend and similar to you i very much recommend whatever works for you yes uh, yeah i have friends that have found it through yoga alone through meditation alone through a combination of those through therapy through 12-step fellowships um you know so i i i'm a long-term uh, or long-time meditator myself uh, and I've been in and out of therapy for many years, and I just got myself back into therapy about three months ago, um, even though I still attend various fellowships from time to time. But I found I needed, you know, I, I just felt called. I needed to go deeper, and um, it's been exceptionally helpful. And, uh, and so, but again, yeah, to get back to that point, I just, similar to what you said, I, what, find what works for you. Explore. Yeah. I would say definitely honor honor who you are and your personality and what you feel drawn to. What what I would add to that, Chris, is for people who are recovering from trauma, mm. especially complicated trauma, right? Maybe multiple forms. Sure. I I would recommend some one on one clinical support. Yeah. Because I think I think it's understandably scary to open things up and to expose trauma to another person. And so it might be tempting for, for some of your listeners to seek out help and support in a group right. that offers a little more feeling of anonymity. Right. And while I'm all for group, you know, group healing, yeah. I, I think it's really essential. I'm also I'm also aware that there's something about the interpersonal, the intimacy of a one-on-one -on -one experience that um, can be extremely helpful. You know, when people are dealing with something that requires time and and patience and curiosity. Absolutely agreed. I uh, I got divorced. Um, my or my ex-wife and I separated about a year and a half ago, and that's part of why I got myself back into therapy and. Exactly. It's like I still, like I said, go to various meetings from time to time, but it's been through that one-on-one -on -one intimacy, which you mentioned, that I've really been able to explore. I mean, I also have some close friends that um, 
are I'm, I'm lucky because I'm in, in you know I have friends in this field um, that help you know not necessarily in the professional setting uh, yeah. but and and they've helped but yes having that you know one-on-one you sit down with someone and um, a trained professional at least um, it has been very therapeutic and healing and um, helps quite a bit it you know it obviously doesn't completely heal the wounds but it helps you sift through that wreckage and pain and yeah, so it's a it's a wonderful point. Yeah, and and thank you. I just so appreciate your your openness. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's so helpful, right? Because we're all fellow travelers. We're all trying to to figure out how to navigate life, and yeah. especially with our losses. Right. And I I also like to to reinforce for folks that therapy is not only about pain and trauma. Right. It's also about claiming our, our unclaimed gifts and capacities, mm-hmm. really living into who we are more fully. Mm-hmm. And, and so therapy can be a really generative place. I love that. Yes. And, and I found that uh, in my own case as well. So yeah. thank you for, for adding that caveat. Um, well said. So I want to jump back into the book um, and go back to that specific case with the six-year-old girl um, and talk about when you brought your friend Lama Pema uh, into these sessions and if you can talk about that and how that began to help and and what transpired you know when when that interaction began sure well I think probably like many uh, young clinicians, I was I was questioning my abilities and, and feeling concerned about my my capacity to help enough. Sure. And especially especially with this particular child, and and there were other patients too, where the the complexity of the trauma um, just seemed so so multi layered, so profound. I, I was just worried that the traditional analytic frame wasn't going to do it, mm. you know, because therapy happens in real time. Right. And I feel like it's, it's so important to take take the patient's suffering seriously. Yeah, yeah. Right. Do do what you can, obviously with boundaries, right, and 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 mindfulness and thoughtfulness. Yeah. But as I was talking this through with with one of my uh, key analytic mentors, who's also a Buddhist and was aware of my my relationship with Kempo Pema. In the book, I call him Lama Pema. Sure, yeah. We talked about the possibility of bringing him in yeah. because Lama Pema also survived quite a bit of rather harrowing trauma mm. in early childhood and around the same age as this child. Yeah. Um, and it seemed like a good idea, (laughs) (laughs) unconventional because I, I mean, while I had an eclectic analytic training, nobody ever encouraged me to bring visitors to my patient sessions. Right, right. But I also felt that patients do need, they do need community and especially children. Right? Isolated children suffer terribly. And with my adult patients, I can encourage them to go find communities. But with children, I can't, I can't do that. Right. So it occurred to me that I could maybe simulate a feeling of, of safe community, of loving, boundaried right. community. And so as Lama Pema you know, began attending these sessions... Can you talk a little bit about how that helped and, and what exactly, you know, happened for this young girl that you were working with? How how that helped her and what, what transpired? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I think children are particularly impacted by adults who can be honest, right? Honest and direct about their own experience. Yeah. Again, in a way that's not overstimulating or confusing, yeah. but really affirms part of being a person 
involves suffering and it involves loss. Yeah. And it's not it's not inherently shameful. Right. It's just part of the, the human condition to love and to lose. Right. And so I think Lama Pema was able to be very very down to earth and very open about his experience. He he lost his siblings very early in life. Um, he ultimately lost his most of his family. Mm. And went on to, to suffer, understandably, but also to to live a full life and to feel capable and to appreciate himself. Right. So I think he was exemplifying that we can suffer terribly and heal. Yes. And so this helps this young girl, you know, because she has this, this for lack of better phrasing, role model, so to speak, that's there, you know, sharing candidly about his own experience and helping to create that safe space for her. And uh, so, you know, this, like you said, was early on in your career. Um, are you still in touch with this young lady now that she's older? Do you know how she's doing? It's it's been uh, it's been about a year since we have been actively working together. Sure. And um, I think life life continues to have its challenges. Of course. Um, but I I hope that our our work together, our time together, you know, ushered in some some sense of deepest value and resources that can be tapped into as she continues this journey. Wonderful. So let's talk about psychoanalysts and, is, and uh, Buddhism. Sure. And I would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, is there a, a common ground between the two, um, a crossover, so to speak? Yeah, I, I think there is. Both both traditions have uh, a deep respect for what we learn when we become non-judgmentally curious. Mm. And in the analytic tradition, um, Freud described that as evenly hovering attention. And in Buddhism, it's sometimes described as bare attention right. or, or even mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And so in, in both traditions, practitioners are encouraged to try to let that that discursive and particularly the critical part of the mind settle and then bring forth a part that's receptive, curious, wanting to understand more right. in the spirit of um, feeling into more fully what we live through. And what is your perspective on areas where they don't agree or yeah. don't don't connect? And this is so interesting. I, I talk about this a lot with with analytic colleagues, um, and I also talk about this with with Lama Pema, my Buddhist teacher. Sure. I think each tradition has gifts to offer the other tradition. Mm -hmm. And I think Psychoanalysis offers a space where the, the specificity of what a person lives through can be more fully known. Yes. And that's not really offered traditionally in, in Buddhist practice mm. because the, the method in a way is one of just zooming out and recognizing how we're all, we're all part of the human condition, we all experience impermanence and suffering and no self. Right and right. and we we enter our right, right. there's there's a sense of, of our shared condition right but but sometimes we as I was saying earlier we need to to zoom in yeah now I I also think that there are many many gifts that the Buddha Dharma offers to an analytic approach and one gift certainly is is mindfulness. Right. right, which can support the ability to be more reflective. But I also think the emphasis on, on compassion yeah. is key. And I think it's been underemphasized in the analytic tradition. Now I think that when when young analysts or young psychotherapists are training, 
their their mentors hope that they'll be respectful, that they'll be non-judgmental, that they'll treat their patients with with decency and kindness. Mm. But but often there's no specific training. Right. To, to to really open the heart, to be deeply compassionate as you're as you're getting to know a patient. Right. And I think those methods uh, are offered in the Buddhist tradition. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, what I'm curious about is, so you're doing this kind of integrative therapy. What was the response from your colleagues? Like you said, this was something you know that you hadn't really seen done before. And I, yeah. before reading your book, I had I personally never heard of something like this. So, what? Uh, yeah, what was the response that you got? I didn't talk about it. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So I really wasn't getting much of a response until I wrote about it. Yeah. Um, And I didn't talk about it in part because I, I really do feel strongly about honoring the the privacy of each person I work with. Sure. Um, even though I, I sometimes write about those experiences in the spirit of um, trying to offer insights or, or methods to readers who, who might be struggling in similar ways. Right. Um, I think probably there are, are more traditional analysts who wouldn't think it's a great idea, and, and there are probably other clinicians who are receptive to really thinking creatively about how to help each patient to the best of your ability. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, speaking of that, would you like to see more of this happen? Or is there, you know, just from your own perspective, it's all subjective, but you know, is there, would you like to see the practice of psychotherapy possibly change over time? or incorporating more Buddhist teachings or methods or anything that you believe could increase its uh, efficacy? Yeah. Well, I, I would because I, I don't think that we can, of course, any, any good, right, well-trained, decent, well, well-intentioned clinician can offer meaningful support to a patient if if they don't have um, an active religious life or an active spiritual life. Right. However, I think that there are likely going to be untapped inner resources in that clinician right. that could deepen and broaden the work. And I, I also think, Chris, that we have different facets to our being. So every patient is embodied Right, they have psyche, but they also have spirit. Right. And if they're if they're trying to heal and they're going to work with a therapist who doesn't recognize spirit as as reality, hmm. then there's a significant part of that person's experience that will be left out of the treatment. Right. And so what what could you or what would you envision, you know, helping with that? Um, I, I mean, I know you started to touch on it, but um, what what specifically, um, if you have any thoughts on that? Well, I I think that it's worth finding ways to bring into to training programs mm. um, some education in how how we are impacted, how the psyche is impacted by spiritual or religious beliefs and, and practice. Mm. I mean that's that's often not addressed at all. Sure. And I'm not I'm not suggesting that psychotherapy or psychoanalytic training programs become something they're not. Right, of course. But I am suggesting that we could do more to add in components of people's experience that aren't typically addressed in psychotherapy, mm. like their relationship to spirituality or their relationship to race and ethnicity. I mean, there's there's a lot about who we are that's often, if not ignored, just never fully or directly explored. Yeah, yeah very well said. Um, something else I'm very curious about your perspective on, um, I'm very fortunate in the sense that, 
you know, for years, uh, I was in and out of recovery, suffered many relapses, put my family literally through hell. I mean, I went through hell myself, of course, but um, put them through hell. And I'm very blessed that they never gave up on me, never turned their back on me. And that is not the case for so many people I know. Um, so I was hoping you could speak to the importance of family for those, not again, not just recovery from drugs or alcohol, but you know any kind of trauma or healing. So if you could talk about the role that family plays and is it possible for people to still heal from whatever they've gone through without the support of family? Mm. It's such a good question, Chris, and it's a complicated one. Yeah. Right? I mean, you you were really blessed, as you say, to yeah. right? have, have family that stood by you, Yeah. even as they were suffering. Right. And probably having all sorts of feelings about your struggles. Yeah. Um, and as we both know, many, many people do not have that experience. They they feel insufficiently supported or abandoned or rejected by their families. Right. And I I think that family is not linked to biology. Mm. And we all need to feel shored up, right? right? We all need to feel held emotionally and yeah. and by, you know, by beloveds, by yeah. people who have really gotten to know us or are working hard to get to know us. But I don't think those people have to be you know, biologically related to us. Mm. And so, you know, if if people are not not finding that it's possible to to cultivate that reliable, sustainable connection with their family, they need to build it elsewhere. Right. And find you know, find their people. Yeah. Right. Find find the people who are going to hang in there with them. Right. And I know it's hard because you know we all end up with a lot of imprinting from our family experience, and often there's this unconscious uh, belief system about what's inevitably going to happen in any subsequent relationship, especially a group. Right. But in order to challenge those, those negative beliefs, we need new experiences where there are new outcomes, mm. right? where there are people who can hear about our problems with an open mind, right? right? Without, without being critical or rejecting. Right. Yeah. I, so like I said, I'm certainly blessed um, that my family stood by me, but I have a very small family. Essentially... I mean, I have relatives, but really the only ones I stay in close touch with are my parents and brother. And, um, and again, they've just, you know, I almost feel unworthy of the love and support they've given me. I mean, I know I am, but mm -hmm. part of me with all I've gone through still struggles with self-worth issues at times. And, um, but I've also recognized through the years that it, it's been difficult for me because I'm an introverted person by nature, but creating what you said that kind of family outside of my family or um you know support network outside of my family even if it's you know maybe three to six people that i know i can rely on if i'm going through something and i need to reach out aside from just traditional therapy um because you know therapy is usually what an hour a week sometimes people go more than that but you know that's typically i guess what's what happens or at least in my case um but yes, the importance of building that community. Um, for example, I have a friend right now who's in rehab. Um, she just relapsed recently and she doesn't have anyone. And I went, they're allowed visitors on Saturday. So I went and visited her last Saturday. And it was a very interesting experience for me because I actually went through the same exact program that she's in now myself, uh, probably about 10 years ago. And to be on the other side of it was in and of itself interesting. But I remember just my heart kind of hurting that she literally had no, no one else, you know, that, that would be willing to come visit her. And, um, and I just felt like it was the absolute least I can do because I remember how much it meant to me when I was going through programs to have that support. And mm -hmm. she's recognized the importance of when she gets out 
of building that community outside of her family like you, you spoke to because she doesn't really have that support. Um, so It's so important, right? Because yeah. we're relational. Right. And we're relational f- from the first breath to the last. Yes, yeah. Our need of others um, is always with us. Yeah. And I know if, if, if we've had really painful or, or devastating experiences in relationship, it's tempting to defend against those needs, right. trying to, you know, try to relinquish them. Yeah. But it, it can leave people um, too isolated, right? Yeah. And especially with pain and suffering. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, speaking of pain and suffering, part of that and, and the shame and guilt and everything that comes along with it is at least again in my experience a big part of the healing process was finding the willingness to become vulnerable and yeah. in and, and, and sharing with people I trust whether it was a therapist or a close friend you know some of what I've gone through or, or all of what I've gone through or, or however much I could in that moment and I know you speak uh, to that in, in your book and the importance so um, and, and I couldn't agree more. So I would love if you could talk a bit about the importance of finding that strength to be vulnerable um, and, and the benefits, you know, how, how it can help in the healing process. Sure. Yeah, I, I think about this a lot, Chris. And in fact, I, I'll tell you, I had wanted to call the book The Risk of Vulnerability. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Felt that that's, that's what it was about. Right. And... That that title spoke to me because um, vulnerability is risky. Right. Right. If if we've been vulnerable with with our caretakers or the people we depended on the most, and didn't feel reliably supported or cared for, right. Risking the vulnerability again um, for some people feels like too much, too big a risk. Sure. But, but the problem, as we've been talking about, is that um, without the vulnerability, right, without exposing more about what we're actually going through, what we're actually feeling or suffering, we remain hidden. Yeah. Right? People, people will not be able to, to get to know us or respond to what we're going through. Right. And so I know for many people, this issue of vulnerability feels like such a conundrum. Yes. Right? Because there's longing for it. I mean, everybody has some longing for, for connection, for intimacy. Right. That can only come through exposure, right, through mm-hmm. vulnerability. But often the defenses, the, the protective defenses, really pick up steam over time. And so they mitigate against getting what what is most longed for. Right. And so how how do we learn to become vulnerable? Is there a specific... I mean, again, I know each person is their own individual, so there's probably not just one way. But in your experience, you know, um, is there any advice you could give, you know, that speaks to someone who, like you said, has that longing but also has the fear, it's, which I know can be almost overwhelming at times to open up and, and be vulnerable. It's so, you know, how, just generally speaking, how could mm-hmm. someone begin to even just a little bit kind of crack that shell, so to speak? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I, I do think this is where spiritual community or recovery communities, places where... People can dip their toe in the water. Mm. They don't necessarily have to talk to anybody. That's right. <laughs> right. They don't have to expose anything until until it feels safe enough to do so. But I think there needs to be some experience that challenges the fear. Sure. Right. There needs to be some experience where a person is is sensing that. They're they're in a relatively safe place. Right. No place is perfectly safe, but we need to, to feel that we're we're in a, a, a somewhat reliably respectful, welcoming place. Mm. 
And often religious communities, the healthy ones, are good at warmly receiving whomever walks in the door. Sure, yeah. So I encourage people, even if it feels scary, to to risk it. Yeah. And, and if they have a weird experience, which can happen, right. Right, to, to try a few different communities. Yeah. Or as, you know, if you're in recovery, a few different meetings. Exactly. Right? To, to really keep at it until right. you have a sense that you might be among people who, who have what you need to feel like you can begin to heal. Right. I'm so glad you said that because I know we've been speaking quite a bit about Buddhism, but, um, you know, I personally have found so much wisdom and help and guidance from all of the great wisdom traditions, you know, specifically the more um, mystical tenets of them, whether it's, you know, Zen or Vedanta or, you know, the mystic Christian lineage. Um, but there's, you know, beautiful teachings in all of them. And I, you know, I have plenty of friends that are devoutly Buddhist or devoutly into Hinduism or Christianity to each their own. But um, like you said, if you don't have that exploring and finding what works and, and very well said about the meetings too, because I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that said, oh, I tried an AA meeting or an NA meeting once and I didn't like it. It's like, okay, well, try a different one, you know, yes. like, or, or there's, you know, there's a wonderful Buddhist new, newer Buddhist recovery community called Refuge Recovery that Noah Levine started. And that's, you know, a great alternative to those that struggle with the God word. And um, so there's no shortage of means and methods available. Yeah. Uh, um, so anyways, another I know we're starting to run short on time, but something I definitely wanted to talk to you about, which is one of the central themes I found in your book is and it resonated so much for me and again many people that i i work with personally is loss and how that is what leads us onto whether it's the spiritual path or into therapy or into a recovery program i mean i did not start going to meetings or take up meditation because my life was great you know i it, it was because i had hit the rock bottom and then the bottom gave out and you know that happened more than once so, you know, can you talk a bit about loss and, you know, the role it, it plays and how it can actually potentially help us in, in, you know, becoming a catalyst towards our healing and growth? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. It's, loss, I think, is, um, it, it is one of the most painful experiences, right, but also one of the most heart-opening. Yeah. And just by nature of being embodied, right, and, and by nature of getting very attached to other people, right, who are also embodied, mm -hmm. we all suffer a lot of loss. Yeah. And you know, there's the, the more obvious and, and profound loss through death, and there's, there's loss through the end of relationship, there's loss through war, right, through, through financial circumstances, uh, there's loss of identity, right, through, through illness. There's so many ways we experience loss. And as painful as it is, I, I personally find uh, loss extremely challenging. Yeah. But I'm also aware that if I can stay open to it, which is hard, and of course we can't do that all the time, but if I can challenge myself to really try to allow the loss to impact me, mm. right, without numbing out or dissociating or minimizing or telling myself this is not a big deal, this happens to everybody, other people's losses are worse, and all the ways we try to get distance yeah. from loss, then I can actually connect more fully, more meaningfully with others. Yeah. Right? Because loss is a common ground. Yeah. It's a it is a an extraordinary common ground. Absolutely. And the more fully I can feel my own losses, the more I'm gonna be able to stay open to other people's losses. Mm. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. I mean I've I've said before myself that you know if there's nothing else that connects us in this life 
it is pain. You know, the yeah. fact that we all feel pain, we all experience suffering, we all experience loss. Yeah. And at the end of the day, all any of us want is to find some semblance of peace yeah. or joy, contentment. You know, and I try to remember that not to get political, but, you know, looking at our president right now, you know, I'm not a fan, uh, but, you know, I, I look at him and I try to remember or, or think about maybe seeing like a wounded seven year old child that's yeah. acting out, you know, and and that helps me bring compassion. Not that that justifies any of said person's actions or any anyone that does, you know, causes harm to another being. But um, one, you know, there's a Buddhist saying that I, I absolutely love where it talks about um, and, you know, to each their own, what, whatever you believe you believe, but it talks about reincarnation and that we've reincarnated so many times that every single person literally on the planet right now at one point or another has been our mother, you yes. know, and, and, and they say that to help bring compassion you know, to other beings. And so maybe you've had a, a rough experience with your mother in this life. You know, just think of someone else. Think of a dear friend or, or yeah. you know, some, someone else. And I, I absolutely love that, you know, and it helps me, like, because I still struggle too. You know, I've been on the path for 15 years and, you know, I still, people still piss me off. It happens. Like, I'm a human being, you know, and, but I try my best. And uh, it's it's because of those practices that at least for me, I find, you know, it helps me to show up in the world and be more compassionate and, uh, and be of service and be more gentle, far from perfect, but yeah. it helps. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, that's, that's beautiful. And I mean, this, this, int this issue of loss, it is so relevant politically, right? Mm. You, you mentioned the president, and well, I don't want to take us too far afield. I, I suspect that that family system got defended against loss. Mm. He suffered the loss of his brother. I suspect that got defended against. Sure. Right? And, and whatever bullying was happening in the family that may have contributed to that loss, right. also defended against. And, and look at what happens when we shut down, right, to our own pain, our own losses, then we can develop what's, what's called in analytic uh, circles, empathic lesions, mm. right? If, if we're not empathic with ourself and our own pain, we really will not be able to sustain genuine empathy for other people and their pain and their loss. Right. Yeah, and so there you have it, right? It's uh, and again, just to reiterate, that's at least for me why these practices, you know, what in therapy and loving kindness meditations, and just finding what works, or in my case, finding what worked for me, and you know, encouraging others to find what works for you, you know. So you, because when, I, you know, when I heal, I'm not just healing myself; I am able to then show up in the world and be a more compassionate person on a good day, you know, like again, far from perfect, but you know, in healing myself, I'm helping in a way to help heal others. And, and not that I'm, you know, playing a therapeutic role, but just by being a gentler person, you know, and maybe giving that smile to a stranger on the street or, you know, paying the toll for the person behind me, you know, little, little acts of kindness, which who knows the ripple effects that those may have. You know, so anyways, um, we're, we're running out of time. What I, what I tend to like to do, uh, is l give the last word to my guest, because again, there's so much more in this book that we didn't cover. Um, I can't recommend it enough to readers. Um, it, it really is wonderful. The, the, it's again called to heal a wounded heart, the transformative power of Buddhism and psychotherapy in action from Shambhala, who I mentioned, I absolutely love. Um, but is there anything that we didn't cover that you would like to leave uh, the listeners with? Well, I, I guess I would just like to speak to this this tumultuous time that we're living through. Yeah. And I think I think many people throughout the globe are are struck by how how turbulent the world feels right now. 
and and I think sometimes that can it can generate some pessimism or a feeling of not really having enough enough power enough agency to to facilitate healing mm -hmm. and I think you you just touched on a really critical point Chris that that when we take our own experience seriously right not not to get lost in it right. Right? Not, not to get stuck in it but to really be deeply curious about who we are right. what we've lived through what we need to to recover from or or work through slowly slowly for most of us right then the more we'll feel empowered capable right of in some way addressing the, the the tumult the global suffering that we see right now yeah right well we'll be in the world with more sensitivity more consciousness right, right? as you say we can't always tap into it skillfully but we'll be more likely to have those resources available to ourselves and others mm -hmm. so I, I really want to encourage people to get to know themselves <laughs> right? that we all have a story that's worth knowing yeah and worth telling yeah beautifully said and a wonderful way i think to uh wrap this up i can't thank you enough for your time um i have absolutely adored this conversation thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insight and i want to let listeners know that they can find you at drpilarjennings.com and the spelling uh is d-r-p-i-l-a-r-j-e-n-n-i-n-g-s.com if you're listening to this on the be here now network the link will be there so you can just scroll down and click on that um and I think that's about that. Pilar, thank you again so very much for your time. Thank you, Chris. It's been a real joy to talk with you. Oh, the feeling is more than mutual. Thank you. Thanks.